In just over a decade, seven high school students in Thunder Bay, Ontario were found dead. They were Indigenous teens, hundreds of miles from home in search of an education that most kids in Ontario don't have to leave their communities for. Journalist Tanya Talega tells their stories in her new book. It's called Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death and Hard Truths in a Northern City. It was a finalist for the 2017 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction, and we're pleased to welcome the Atkinson Foundation Fellow for 2017-18, Tanya Talega, to our studio tonight. So good to see you again. Thank you so much. This is a great book. I, I told you I read it many months ago, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, my goodness, it's a sad, sad book, but it's in a very important read. So let's get to this. How did you wind up, up in northwestern Ontario, investigating the seven deaths of these young people in the first place? It's actually a story in itself. I went up there to cover the federal election. I was a provincial reporter at the time at the Toronto Star, and the federal election was in full swing, and I wanted to get into the action. And so I pitched to my editors a story on why it is that Indigenous people don't vote. This was, again, in 2011, so it was Stephen Harper versus Jack Layton. And this was also, too, before the TRC had made its report. This was before social media um, was uh, really sort of pervasive, considering Indigenous news and Indigenous politics. And so I went up there to do a story on why it is um, Indigenous people just aren't voting. I knew the answer as to why, um, one of those answers being that First Nations people did not have the vote until 1960. But my editor thought, wow, this is a great idea. It sounds exotic. So why don't you go up and do the story? So I did. And I went to Thunder Bay to speak to Stan Berdy. And Stan Berdy used to be the Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which is a territory that is quite large. It is uh, encompasses 49 northern First Nations in an area roughly the size of France, stretching from north of Thunder Bay to James Bay, north to Hudson Bay, and west to Manitoba. Massive, just massive. It's, it's a huge, huge territory. About 45,000 people live there. And so, and it goes over um, two ridings as well. And so I, I went up there to talk to him and say, you know, what's, what's happening? Why is it that, uh, that Indigenous people aren't voting? And as soon as we sat down and I asked that question, he looked at me and he said, why aren't you doing a story on Jordan Wabas? And I thought maybe he wasn't hearing me. So I repeated my question. And then he said to me, you know, Jordan has been missing for 70 days. And we went back and forth like that for a while. Um, I'm gonna say about 10 minutes or so, you know, me asking about the election, him talking about Jordan. And I realized that I was not gonna get my, my questions answered. And I also realized that I was sitting in the presence of a grand chief who was trying to tell me something, and I wasn't listening to him. So he, I put... He had a bigger mission. He did, he did. And um, so I sort of put the kind of crazy Toronto journalist side aside, mm -hmm. and I listened to him. Um, and then he told me that Jordan was the seventh student to go missing or to die while at school in Thunder Bay since 2000. And I never handed in that story on the 2011 election. Uh, knowing the way newspaper editors sometimes can be, when you called the star and said, I know you sent me up here to do this story, but here's what's really going on that we really mm -hmm. need to follow, what was the reaction? You know, the reaction was really, really good. Um, they couldn't believe it either. The thing I just couldn't understand was why is it that seven kids, at that point Jordan um, had not been found. But why was it the seven kids had gone missing or to die in Thunder Bay since 2000? Why wasn't that making national news? I mean, why wasn't I seeing news trucks up there? Why wasn't this all over the front page of the Globe and Mail and every other newspaper? Because if it happened in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver, you can bet it would have been front page that's news. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so uh, my editors were, you know what? That's a really good story. Do it. And so I did. And we played it right. We put it on the front page that day. Um, it was in May that the story came out in 2011. And we had a picture as well of one of the teachers from the school because uh, Stan dropped me off at Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School where six of the seven kids went to school and um, sort of dropped me off at the principal's office and said, here, this is Tanya. Tell her the story. And you, with that entree, off yeah, to the races right. you were. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, it's got a, a very controversial, I guess, uh, role in all of this. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about this school? 
School was opened in 2000, um, October of 2000. And when the school opened, um, they're in, uh, the school is in an old building that uh, the city wasn't using anymore and the local, um, the local Lakehead uh, school board wasn't using anymore. So they bought it, uh, North Anishinaabe Education Council, to run a high school there because there are no high schools in the communities, um, the NAN communities, no proper high schools for the kids to go to. Mm. So if they want a high school education, they have to travel to either Sioux Lookout or they travel to Thunder Bay to go to school. Give people down here a sense of how far some students have to go from their home reserves to go to this school. Right, about 500, 600 kilometers away. They have to take a small plane. A lot of these uh, communities are uh, remote, they're fly-in. Um, and they also are so small, 300 people, 1,000 people. There are no traffic lights in these communities. Oftentimes there's no boiling, uh, there's no water that you can drink. So big time culture shock, leaving Huge. the reserve, going to this That's school right. in, the, That's in right. the middle of a city. And many of the kids also spoke in their language. And so they're, when they're coming into Thunder Bay, they're speaking and functioning in English as well. So, uh, I mean, on the one hand, a, a school where indigenous kids can go and kind of mm -hmm. be in the majority and not feel, you know, out of sorts, but on the other hand, very out of sorts because they're so far out of their culture zone, it's not funny. Mm -hmm. how, did, how, does, how does everybody handle all that? The school is actually a really special, quite incredible place, and everyone that works in the school, they are all, they're not just teachers, they're surrogate parents for every single child that goes there. Um, the kids are fed, they're, uh, they have their breakfast there, they have their dinner there, they're, there's an elder on staff, there's a nurse practitioner, Everyone on staff really goes above and beyond to make sure the kids are safe and everyone there also knows what's happened. Uh, when the school opened in 2000, no one could have predicted that within one month of the school opening, they would lose one of their, their students, Jethro Anderson, and he had just turned 15. He was in grade nine. Now, your book's called Seven Fallen Feathers, a mm -hmm. reference, of course, to the, to the seven students who disappeared and eventually were found to be dead. Uh, you know, it, it's enough for one school in a city of mm -hmm. two and a half million people like Toronto to go missing and to have that be, you know, that, that would put a school in crisis to have one school, one student go missing. Seven in one school. How do they deal with that? Six in, in the one school Six in, and in Dennis, uh, Frank, Jordan and went yes. to Mattawa, um, yeah. which was uh, in another part of Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. It's hard, you know, it's hard. Uh, I think that... Um, Unless you're living it, it's really tough to, tough to understand. I've been in the school many, many times, and I've spoken to a lot of the kids that go to school there. Every single child that I speak to has a story about racism. And it's, it's not just uh, something that's happened to their friend or someone they've heard of. It's something that's happened to them, too. They'll tell you stories about um, walking to school and having garbage thrown at them or being called names and being told to go back to where they came from. This is like a, a daily reality. And the people that work in the schools, the teachers, the support staff, everyone, they're all fully aware of what the kids are living through and the changes that they're, they're having coming from northern places and being alone in the city in a boarding house coming to school. They have to do things like uh, things that we wouldn't think of in, in the city, things like how do you cross a street? How do you take a bus? When the students start at Dennis Franklin Camardi, they actually get pamphlets as part of their welcome package that talks about how to do these things. Because they've never done it before. That's right, that's right. I mean, everything is, is all very new to them. Mm -hmm. And the teachers are fully aware of this, and they do things like they have um, uh, vans go out at nighttime looking for the kids to make sure all the kids are safe and are at home. Mm -hmm. Tanya, on our Jumbotron back there, you can see the cover of your book, mm -hmm. and there is some beautiful artwork there, and we're going to isolate some of it and I want to okay. bring it up here and have you just sort of describe can we bring that up Sheldon and I, I want you to just basically tell us what's in this painting here what 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 should we be drawing our eyes towards well the whole painting is really a thing of absolute beauty when you see it for the first time when I saw it for the first time it just it takes your breath away Christian Morisot painted this painting and Christian is the father of Kyle Morisot and he is one of the seven fallen feathers Christian painted this after the end of the inquest in June 2016 to remember, remember the children. And so what you're looking at are all seven of the fallen feathers and why he 
calls the students the seven fallen feathers is because he was really sick and tired of listening to the media and listening to just everyone refer to them as the seven dead students. Mm -hmm. He said to me, you know what, all of these kids, they were loved. They have their own identities. They're their own people. And it's really important we remember them like that. And it was a, a friend of his that suggested Seven Fallen Feathers as the title of his painting. And he has adopted that. And he gave me the permission to, to use the painting and also to, to use the title. And you can see along the bottom all seven of the Bring it back the up, kids. Sheldon, if you yeah. would. Yeah, let's, let's see it again. Yeah, you do see the seven along right. the bottom. You can, and so do you see the one in the middle is with yellow on her shoulders? Yes. That's Robin. She was the only girl out of the seven. And the one on um, the, the, the one on the top right, the highest figure, that is Kyle, his son. Hmm. And this is a picture of the seven feathers going into the afterlife. Let's do an excerpt from inside the pages of your book now. Students between the ages of 14 and 21 were coming down to Thunder Bay, and for many of them, it would be the first time they'd live in a city or were far from their parents. The culture shock would be startling. You've touched on this already, but mm -hmm. talk about how well or badly they adapted to these incredibly new circumstances they found themselves in. It's hard, you know. Imagine, uh, I have two teenagers. I can't imagine sending one of them so far away from me to function in another language to go to school without their parents, you know, and often too you have to think of in 2000 when Jethro was there. This is before the advent of cell phones, before every child carried cell phones. I mean, they were still pretty expensive back then in 2000. And a lot of these kids too, they're coming from homes that um, have struggles. Some of the homes, there's not much money, you know, so you're sending your children down too and it's an issue if you need money to go to the movies or to buy another winter jacket, things like that. And often you've got to rely on the school to help out with those little mm -hmm. things. And often too, if you're a kid, you don't ask. You don't ask to say, you know, hey, my coat doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit me anymore. And um, little things like that that you would rely on a mom or dad when you're at home, it's really hard when you're so far away. And they're also, again, they're surrounded by things they never saw before. In a lot of these communities, and all of them, the only stores are really northern stores. Northern stores are small catch-all stores that sell everything from rubber boots to ham. Um, and that's the only store in the community. When they get to Thunder Bay, it's like exotic. Mm -hmm. Everything there, it, there are theaters, there is a, there's a big shopping mall, and yet, there's a food court. But there's a lot of hanging out by the river as well. Which is not there the shopping is, mall. What, there is. What, there what, is. What was the lure of that? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, well, there's there's many reasons for the lure of the river. Um, rivers are in indigenous culture are very um, very prominent and very important. I mean, rivers carry water. Water is life. Rivers and water surround most of the communities where the kids come from. You know, they sit by the water. They think of home. And I'm going to say, too, that lots of teenagers like to party away from adults, right? And a, a, a great social equalizer can be hanging out by themselves at the river. I mean, there were no other places for them to go, really, too. You know, there were no large cultural centers that they were going to hang out to play video games at. So the kids would get together and they would go down by the water. And that's, that's kind of scary because you just don't know who you're going to encounter down there. Well, let's start to tell that story. How did the students ultimately go missing? Well, that's, that's a good question, and thank you. Um, and one of the things that came out in the inquest that always struck me as a central, uh, a central point to this entire story was no evidence was given whatsoever as to how the five boys that died in the water wound up in the water. None whatsoever. And we still don't know? That's right. So there is evidence about how they died. You know, the toxicology reports are back. The, the coroner's reports can indicate certain things, but the coroner's reports can't indicate how the kids got into the water. What was the most frequent cause of death? Drowning, drowning. But you're also pulling bodies from water that have been in the water for mm. a week, two weeks, or in Jordan's case, longer, months. I mean, there's not a lot. So the, some, the dead do tell their own stories, and some, um, there are some markings, and you can tell some things, but you can't tell everything. Can you tell if alcohol was involved? Oh, yes, yes. And, um, and some of the deaths, there was, uh, there was definitely alcohol involved. But again, I go back to 
how did they wind up in the water? There is no, no one would go swimming in Thunder Bay at the end of October or in November. That just doesn't happen. And I don't care if you're intoxicated or not. And all of these kids do come from water communities. I mean, they're surrounded by water. They're familiar with water. It's, uh, so it's, the, the assumption is there had to be some foul play involved, which ended Something up, happened. Yeah. Something happened. And that question remains to this day. Do you think we'll ever get an answer to that? I hope so. I hope so. You know, there are things that are changing. There's a Bear Clan patrol of Indigenous uh, searchers that monitor the water now. They walk every night to see what's happening. There are safety measures that I'm hoping are going to be in place very soon, lighting around the water and areas. And I, I hope that Thunder Bay is, is really going through something right now. I mean, with all of the reviews that are happening up there and the hard looks that are happening as to why this is occurring in this city, I'm really hoping that things will turn around because it's just, it's, it's unbelievable that children are ending up in water. More on Thunder Bay in a second. I, I do want to f have you tell us how Jethro Anderson's mother found out about her son's demise. I'll tell you about his, his aunt. His aunt was his boarding, um, his boarding parent, uh, Dora Morris. Lovely, amazing, amazing woman. All the families are so strong. and. Um, Jethro was lucky to have Dora as his boarding parent. Dora is his aunt. Um, her brother is his father, was his father. And um, she cared for him like a son. She often had him um, throughout his young life. And so she loved him very much. And she had her own children uh, with her husband, Tom. And they live in uh, on the Fort William side of Thunder Bay. And he didn't come home one night. It was in October. The school had just opened, so this is in 2000. He had just turned 15. He didn't come home, and so when she got home, because she works at uh, a lodge in Thunder Bay, it was around 10 o'clock, she doesn't see Jethro. She asked her son, Nathan, where's Jethro? And he's like, well, he didn't come home. And so she got into her car with her husband, and they started to drive up and down the streets of Thunder Bay looking for him. After a few hours of this, it was well past midnight, I think it was around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, she got back home and she phoned the police. And when she called the police, whoever answered the phone told her, oh, just don't worry about it, he's probably just out there partying like all the other Native mm -hmm. kids. Yep. And then the phone was hung up. She couldn't believe what she had just heard. So she got back in her van and she started searching the streets again. And it took the Thunder Bay Police six days to start looking for Jethro Anderson. And by that point, Jethro's mom had come down from Casabonica Lake First Nation. Lots of people, her family had come down and they were searching. Indigenous searchers were out looking for Jethro at that point. Here's uh, Sheldon. I'm on number 11 here. Let's do this excerpt from the book. An undercurrent of racism runs through Thunder Bay society. It can be subtle and insidious, but it can also be in your face. Indigenous people have learned to silently put up with the abuse. When they complain to police, they are often not taken seriously or their claims are ignored. Can you tell us about what conclusions you came to about, um, well, a number of things here. Let's start with uh, the Thunder Bay Police's investigation of these events. I was lucky enough to have all of the inquest exhibits and uh, the testimony of the inquest. It was eight months long, 200 witnesses remarkable amount of uh, testimony and exhibits to go through. It was really interesting to see the trajectory of the investigations. Um, I'm thinking especially too of Jordan Wabas, the, uh, who his body was found in 2011, and he's the one that Stan was telling me about in the first place, and uh, I started to write stories about him. It, I was really surprised, you know, sometimes interviews with um, people of interest were carried out and then all of a sudden questioning stopped. Um, the police notes just kind of ended and I didn't really understand how that could be. And then there was also too sort of the theory or the working theory seemed to be that Jordan got off a public bus at around 10 o'clock at night in the Thunder Bay February weather of, 
you know, minus 30, it was minus 30 that evening, it was very cold out. And he was dressed like a teenager, you know, which meant he had like, he had pants on, he had Adidas running shoes on, he was wearing like a hoodie, you know, and a, a, a jacket over top, and he had a baseball cap on his head, you know, there, were, there was no thermal underwear. Not quite no, minus 30. No, exactly, yeah. you know, he, he looked like a teenager. So he, he gets off the bus and the theory was, the working theory, that he managed to get from the bus stop, which was a stone's throw almost away from his boarding home. And instead of going home, he took off to the water and went to the river, the Kaministiqua River. That's quite a hike. It's over two kilometers. Um, one of the lawyers, she has driven this. I have driven it. And it's really quite remarkable from where his body was found and where his boarding home is. I can't imagine in minus 30 weather just leaving the bus and winding up there. So highly unlikely he would have done that of his own volition. Right, and also too, where he was found um, by the James uh, Street Swing Bridge, he would have had to go over all these rocks as well to get into the water. I mean, hmm. who would do that in February? Uh, one doesn't want to tar an entire city with a broad brush. But the question needs to be asked. Based on what you've discovered, do you think Thunder Bay is a racist city? I think that racism runs through every city. I think that that's true. I think that there has been, there are undercurrents of subtle racism that have gone through Canadian society for a long, long time. Is it a bigger problem there than anywhere else? You know what, statistically it is a bigger problem there than anywhere else. If you look at Statistics Canada's la latest report, they say that it's got the most hate crimes out of any other city. And I do believe that to be true. When you walk into Dennis Franklin Cromartie or when you discuss with any Indigenous person in Thunder Bay what their experiences are, they'll tell you. They'll tell you stories like what I was telling you earlier about the students having garbage thrown at them, being called names, being mm -hmm. told to go back home. I mean, there are Facebook postings of, uh, of overt racism. There are, um, sadly, there's also, that's been publicly shared in newspapers as well. You know, Thunder Bay has so many issues and problems, and it's happened for so long there. It's only now, I think, in the last just little while that people are finally waking up to what's been going on in Thunder Bay. And, you know, the story of Jethro Anderson is a perfect example of people calling, Indigenous people calling, and ha not having their calls returned or being told something untoward on the phone. And it's not just with the students, too. It's with other things as well. It's with assaults. It's with murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. I've uh, done a lot of work on, on that in Northern Ontario as well, and that's a fundamental complaint. And you can see that complaint across Canada too, of when people call to say, my daughter's missing or uh, my sister is missing, how the calls are handled. Historically, historically the calls have not been handled well. Mm. Not all calls, but We've got a few minutes left here, and I want to tackle a couple of more things. Uh, Sheldon, let's go to this report card on the recommendations, because um, Aboriginal Legal Services, uh, representing the families of six of the seven Indigenous victims, released a report card on how all of the institutions performed. And here are the grades. The Government of Canada got a D, City of Thunder Bay a C+, Nishnabi Aski Nation got a C+, the Province of Ontario a C+, the Thunder Bay Police Service a B+, Northern Nishnabi Education Council and Dennis Franklin Cromartie First Nations High School got an A minus. <clears throat> the report issued a grade of C plus for progress overall, uh, emerging after all of this. Uh, let me, I mean, I guess the thing that really stands out there is that the Thunder Bay Police Service got a B plus. Um, what do you think of that? It's an interesting grade, and they have changed their missing persons protocol, which is is huge. It's really important that that happen that uh, when calls are made to the police about somebody who's missing, especially a student, that the police respond and act. That is now different, very different. They have really stepped up their game that way with, um, with press releases as well and with going out and, you know, even trying to, trying to make friends, you know, build bridges with the Indigenous community there. 
So I think that that's probably a reason why of the B plus grade. And the, the other grades are also interesting. You know, um, Nishinaabe Aski Nation has, I believe, as you said, it's a C plus, but it's, it's hard as well for them to do a lot of the, the recommendations that need to happen and what they were supposed to do with the inquest because they don't get the correct amount of funding from the federal government in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they're limited as to actually what they can possibly do. And of course, the government of Canada got a D. Um, that's actually kind of generous because... Should, should be an F, you think? <laughs> you know, it... Um, yes, I mean, after the inquest happened, a lot of the information that came from the government of Canada as well, we'll support you with that, that, uh, that recommendation. Great idea, you know, we'll support you, we'll support you. But without the proper mechanisms behind that support, funding and legislative, I mean, it's, they're all just still recommendations that sit on the shelf. What effect do you think the deaths, the investigations, the increasing scrutiny, what has it all had on the city of Thunder Bay? I think it's a great awakening for the city of Thunder Bay. I really do. You know, there is right now the um, Ministry of the Attorney General, an offshoot agency, is up there looking at what's happening in Thunder Bay. They're looking at the Thunder Bay Police Force for systemic racism. Um, Senator Murray Sinclair is investigating the Thunder Bay Police Board for their failure to police the Thunder Bay Police. These are two massive investigations which I think ultimately is going to change the face of justice in Thunder Bay. I think Frank Iacobucci's report as well, Justice Iacobucci's report, also helps to, to change the face of justice. And that's, that's a big piece of this puzzle. Just reminding everybody, I think that's the one that suggested that if you're going to have just justice. There have got to be more Indigenous people That's on right. juries, for example. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's 100% true. And not just on juries. Police boards have to have Indigenous people. I mean, there is no Indigenous person on the Thunder Bay Police Board. Hmm. That's remarkable. You know, there's just recently they've added a position, but that isn't, um, it's, it's more like someone who can observe. There needs to be Indigenous people on the police board. There needs to be Indigenous people in the council, the city council as well. I mean, there's going to be a new mayor race coming up, and it would be, wouldn't it be great if that council just, you know, started to reflect a little bit more the, the faces in Thunder Bay. That would be, that would be wonderful. So I, I think it's going to, I think Thunder Bay is going through a sea change. Look at the monitor up there, and we'll finish up on this. This is a photo of Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, and he is presenting your book to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, your book has shone a light on what has been a truly devastating situation in northwestern Ontario. Uh, I guess the government of Canada and the government of Ontario, uh, given the attention your book has got, and there it is in the hands of the Prime Minister, they can no longer say, we didn't know anything about this. <laughs> so I guess my final question is, uh, how hopeful are you that all of this attention is going to bring about some constructive change? Change is going to take a long time. Change means many, many things. Change means Jordan's principle has to be enacted throughout this country. And just so everyone knows what that is, that means bringing equity and services to all children, Indigenous children, living on reserve. So they have the same amount of opportunity and services that all other children do across Canada. Things like high schools in communities that need them. This book talks about all of those things, and it also shows the reasons why the seven fallen feathers died. There are so many pieces to it and so many explanations. All of those things play a role, and until Canada addresses equity, we won't be ahead. Well, I have to say, uh, I think there's a better chance of some or all of those things happening, given that you have shone the light on this as you have in that book. I, I, I tell you, it, it's one of the hardest books I've ever read in my life. Uh, but so worth reading, and I hope a lot of people do, because it's um, you've done a great job here, I have to say. Chimikwich. Chimikwich to you too. Tanya Talega, author, Seven Fallen Feathers, Racism, Death, and Hard Truths in a Northern City. Thanks so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.